Um, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Brian Dolan, who needs, of course, no introduction to this audience. Brian is visiting us uh, from uh, Minutes virtually. We're not even allowed to join, to um, go to Minutes or have him, uh, or have people, he, our seminars here. So let's um, welcome him again. And uh, um, he's going to tell us about uh, revisiting the CPT theorem, discrete symmetries and the Lorentz group. Uh, so I hand it over to you, Brian. We do allow questions as you Go okay. so unmute yourself if you want to uh, ask questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Denjo. Um, well, as you can see from the title, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the C CTP theorem, which is which is not new, of course. Um, I'm not sure that much of what I say is really new. There may be one or two things, um, but I will be doing it from a different perspective. Um, and um, I'm not sure if, if I was expecting more PhD students. I don't see many PhD students among the participants. Um, but the audience for these seminars is, is quite varied. And I know there are a lot of people who, who don't have a background in relativistic quantum field theory. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have um, tried to, uh, to make things hopefully accessible to um, even to people who, um, who are not experts in quantum field theory. Um, for the people who are experts in quantum field theory, then, and there are people here who know more about it than I do, um, I, I hope you won't be too bored. Um, I will be doing things in a different way. So um, I, I hope you might get something out of, out of the talk from that. Okay, so I'll start off um, just with a little bit of history about parity, um, charge conjugation, and time reversal. And um, then I'll go on to discuss the way discrete symmetries as a lens group are, are implemented. Um, and what I, what I really want to, um, to get at in this talk is um, I'm, I'm going to ask the question, what's the subgroup generated by parity and time reversal? Parity and time reversal are discrete elements of the Lorentz group. Um, so the repeated application of parity and time reversal um, will generate um, a discrete group. And the question is, what is that group? And um, I'll argue that as long as we only um, consider parity and time reversal, then uh, there's actually um, quite a few possibilities. But when we include charge conjugation, then things are, are brought down to a um, more manageable situation. And if I have time, I'll discuss uh, some, some applications to neutral pseudoscalar mesons and then <clears throat> summarize the, uh, what I've been trying to say. Okay, so famously parity violation was discovered in the 1950s. Um, I mean, up until then, everyone just assumed that parity was a, a, a symmetry of the fundamental forces in nature. <clears throat> and electromagnetic forces are invariant under parity and in, inverting in the spatial origin. Um, despite what we learn about right-hand rules in, in school, um, the magnetic field is a, is a polar vector. Um, so when you reflect in the mirror, um, the, the situation looks, ex looks exactly the same. Um, in fact, uh, the, 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 the direction of the magnetic field is actually conventional. Um, if you came from a different planet and somebody told you to calculate things using a left-hand rule, you'd get exactly the same physics. Um, because if you use the left-hand rule, the magnetic field would point in the opposite direction, but the, the Lorentz force, which involves V cross B, would be the same. All physical effects actually involve two vector products, so it doesn't matter whether you use a left-hand rule or a right-hand rule, um, you'd always get the same answer. So it was kind of implicitly assumed that parity was a symmetry of nature um, up until the, the 1950s. Of course, in chemistry, people knew there was, there was left different level and dextro sugars and stuff, but that, was, um, that, that wasn't arising from any fundamental asymmetry. Um, but then in the, in the 50s, the, in cosmic ray physics initially, um, some particles were discovered that um, caused a problem. It was called the tor theta puzzle at the time. They found two particles, which had um, the same mass, the same charge, um, but they had two different, very different decay modes. And the lifetime was, was similar as well. One of them went to three pions, one of them decayed to three pions, and the other decayed to two pions. Now the pion, um, the intrinsic parity of a pion is negative, so a three pion state has negative parity, and a two pion state has positive parity. parity. So these two particles had opposite parity, and, um, but it was weird that they had all, all their other physical properties were the same. Um, <clears throat> and that led Li and Yang, of course, to question uh, whether or not parity the real, Li and Yang realized that um, parity, conservation of parity had not been checked in weak interactions. Um, and famously, they suggested an experiment that went on uh, to find parity violation. 
So um, the answer to the tau theta puzzle is that the tau and the theta are actually the same particle, what we now call a k on, a k plus. Um, but the, uh, the, the decays, which are weak decays, simply violate parity. It was very quickly realized, however, that if we combined parity with charge conjugation, if we sent particles to antiparticles, then the combination of CP was still in symmetry. But then, just a few years later, even CP, CP violation was, uh, was discovered. Famously, uh, neutral kaons can, can decay to, sometimes decay to two pions and sometimes decay to three pions. And a two pion state has uh, CP plus one, the three pion state has CP minus one. So the, the neutral kaons, the flavor eigenstates, are not um, mass eigenstates. They're not the same as the, as the um, parity eigenstates, the CP eigenstates. CP eigenstates are called, um, usually called K long and K short. Um, long because the lifetime is longer. Uh, but the K long is CP minus and the K short is CP plus. Um, but of course, from a theoretical point of view, um, if we combine charge conjugation with parity inversion, with time inversion, we get the combination CPT, which is um, still a symmetry. And if there are very strong theoretical reasons for believing that CPT is a symmetry of nature. Um, any any uh, set of dynamics that's derivable from a, a local Lorentz invariant Lagrangian has to be CPT invariant. If anyone ever saw a CPT, CPT violating process in nature, it means either your, your physics is not derivable from a Lagrangian or um, causality, is, uh, this is non-local physics. But so far, uh, CPT is still, uh, still okay. So, um, Sorry, Brian, just yeah, people, are comment, people are commenting that they can only see your neck. So I just... Oh, uh, am I not sharing my screen? But your camera is a little low. Oh, uh, oh um, well, I meant to switch my camera off, actually, because you don't need to see my face, do you? Uh, there is great demand for seeing your face. <laughs> okay, massive. Multiple uh, is that any better? <laughs> yes. Does that help? It's fine, Brian. It's fine. <laughs> Just concentrate on this transparency. Don't, don't look at my face. I don't actually record the, the face, so you're, you're <laughs> okay. okay. Um, right. So in, in times of... Um, in terms of, of, of the, the time scale, uh, P violation was discovered in 1957, parity violation, um, oops, sorry. And it was only a few years later that CP violation was discovered in neutral kaon system. Um, <clears throat> uh, since CPT is a symmetry, then CP violation implies um, T violation. But actually T violation wasn't discovered definitively until uh, nearly 50 years later in, um, by the Babar, collaboration in, uh, in neutral B meson systems. Actually, despite the fact that um, the parity violation was, uh, uh, was suggested theoretically, and well, it was um, experimental, it was a t the tau theta puzzle that led to the, um, to the investigation. The theory was actually way ahead of experiment in the sense that um, CPT, the, 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 the significance of CPT was, was, um, seems to have been first appreciated by Schringer. Um, though he didn't prove a CPT theorem, uh, he just he assumed he, he showed a connection between CPT invariance and the spin statistics theorem, and he just assumed uh, CPT. Um, the, the CPT theorem history uh, credits it to uh, Pauli and Luders, um, and uh, but again before uh, Li and Yang's fifty-six paper. Um, in fact, Luders, this, this, in this paper here in 54, um, Luders actually doesn't prove a CPT theorem. He assumes parity invariance, because this was before parity violation had been discovered, and proves a PT theorem. Um, but Pauli actually did the CPT theorem, and Luders extended um, his ideas later on. Though actually, um, John Bell actually gave a proof of the CPT theorem in the same year as Pauli. Uh, this, is, this was part of his PhD thesis. He was doing his PhD in Manchester and Pyrrhals suggested the, the problem to him. Um, and he wrote this, this um, it's a lovely, very clear paper. For some reason, Bell doesn't get credit. And uh, history says it was Pauli and Luders. Um, 
and I don't really understand why. It looks to me as though, I mean, Bell's paper was published the same year as Pauli. Now, Pauli's paper was published, in a, pub, was published in a book. It was an article in a book, so you don't know what month this was, this was published. And, of course, the book takes longer than paper, so the chances are Pauli did this in 54, perhaps. Um, but even so, I, I think there's a very strong argument uh, for, for giving Bell the credit for the CPT even, as well as Pauli and others. And then, of course, there's the famous paper of Li and Yang in 56, when they, uh, they pointed out that uh, parity symmetry had not been checked in weak interactions and suggested to, um, to Wu to do the, the experiment. So that's the history. Um, let me go on to uh, describe CPT act, acting, acting on spinners. And then my discussion is all going to be in terms of, of, of Dirac spinners. Um, if you know how things work on, on spinner half particles, you can always build up other representations. So we have Lorentz transformations um, acting on points in space time. So these are capital lambda, here's a four by four matrix. Acting on a Dirac spinner, uh, we have the Clifford algebra. And uh, there's a four by four matrix D that acts on the Dirac spinner and implements Lorentz transformations on the spinner. But of course, uh, these are different, these, excuse me, these are different representations. Uh, they're inequivalent. The, the, the vector, rep for, the four by four vector representation and this four by four spinner representation are, are not equivalent. In fact, the four by four spinner reputation is that representation is actually reducible. It reduces, it, uh, it's a direct sum of two, two dimensional representations, the positive and negative chirality representations. <clears throat> and what's important um, for what I'm going to say is that um, the complex conjugate if you complex conjugate the spinner, um, you get a different representation. The, uh, the, these are not real representations. Um, so the complex conjugate of D plus is actually um, equivalent to D minus, not quite equal to it, but it's an equivalent representation. So if you conjugate, complex conjugate a D plus, you get a D minus, and if you complex conjugate a D minus, you get a D plus, up to a similarity transformation. So this symbol here is meant to mean uh, similarity. So the, the complex conjugate of the Dirac spinner, um, excuse me, this, is, uh, this isn't correct, sorry, uh, that's an error. This, this is the equation here, I mean, the complex conjugate of, of plus and minus is um, equivalent to, to minus plus. Okay, so how is parity implemented in spinners? On, on, uh, in four dimensional space time, it, we just uh, take space, space like slices, some inertial coordinate system, and parity inverts the, um, the origin, the spatial origin. So we can represent it by this four before matrix on vectors. Um, on spinners, uh, it's usually written like this. Uh, this is, um, so it changes the, the spatial argument and multiplies the spinner by gamma naught, and there's a phase, um, which we shall leave for three at the moment. Time reversal is a bit more involved. Obviously, it reflects, it changes time. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a gamma five, gamma naught here. And there's these matrices here where C is a charge conjugation matrix. And beta is um, the, the matrix that you use for defining the, the adjoint spinners. So uh, psi bar psi is Lorentz invariant. So I just want to point out here that beta actually um, maps you. Or, um, so psi. Side bar here um, is actually in the dual spinner space. So beta's uh, mapping you from, beta's like a metric on the space of spinners. And of course, gamma five is usual chirality operator. So here, this is the way P and T are represented and, um, and I'm going to be considering second quantization here. Um, actually this expression, and again, phi T, sorry, phi T here is, an, is a phase. This expression for, um, time reversal, uh, you, you won't, I've never actually seen it written this way in, in any textbook. Uh, most textbooks will choose a representation of the gamma matrices and uh, you'll see expressions like this for time reversal. For example, Peskin and Schroeder um, have this. Gamma one, gamma three is just a product of a, a gamma one with a gamma three. Um, some people will say, well, beta is equal to gamma naught. So this is just, and they, and they use a representation where C is real. So often you'll see C gamma five here. Um, but that involves choosing a specific representation. And uh, as, as far as is possible here, I'm gonna, 
all the expressions I write down are going to be completely independent of a choice of representation of the gamma matrices. I want to make absolutely clear, absolutely sure, that everything I do um, is completely independent of, of representation. And uh, I quite like to write the parity operator here, gamma naught, as um, gamma five times gamma one, two, three, because then uh, you can see a, a, um, really quite a, a similarity between uh, parity and time here, that parity inverts the spatial coordinates, multiplies by gamma one, two, three, time reversal inverts the time coordinate, multiplies by gamma naught, and then there's a gamma five here. And time reversal is, is um, a little more complicated because of this C star beta sitting here. Can I ask you a question, Brian? Yes, Paul. Because I, saw, I looked at your paper, in the definition of P hat you have. Yes. What is the harm? Why can't I just redefine the P hat by including a phase exponential i pi pi over two? Then um, P hat pi is one. Yes, uh, I, I'll say more about that. Um, at the moment, um, I'm, I'm going to keep the phase arbitrary and I'm going to, um, I'm going to determine the phase later. Um, okay. a, a priori, um, for spinners, a phase is unobservable. An, an overall phase is unobservable for spinners. So a priori, I don't think there are any a priori arguments to tell you what phi should be. And because the symmetries, I was reading uh, the original analysis of Wigner in the Gursey volume, old volume, okay? Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, these are representations up, up to a phase. Okay? Yes. So they're projected representations. So what um, can we find the operators as I say, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can do that. I'm I'm not looking for projective representations at the moment. I'm actually going to look for for um, a, a subgroup of the Lorentz group that's not obtained from uh, by projecting out phases. And I'll determine the phases. The, the phases can be determined. Um, it will turn out actually that phi p is uh, plus or minus pi over two. But um, I'm going to use arguments to derive that rather than just uh, assume it from the start. Okay. Um, okay, so the reason I want to write time reversal like this is that uh, to try and, this exposes the Lorentz transformation properties quite clearly, I hope. Whereas this formula like this do not. Formula like this play havoc with the Lorentz transformation properties. You cannot tell how these things transform when you write gamma one three here. Because the gamma matrix is of course map the space of spinners to the space of spinners and gamma five does too, it's just a product of gamma matrices. Beta here, as I've argued uh, before, it maps the space of spinners actually to the Hermitian conjugate of the dual space. Beta is a, is a Hermitian matrix. My mouse is very sensitive here. Beta is a Hermitian matrix. Um, so the dagger of psi bar is uh, beta psi, and psi bar dagger obviously is, is in the dagger of S dual. So beta maps you from S to the emission conjugate of the dual space. And the charge conjugation matrix, C star is um, multiplying beta from the left. So C star must be acting on the emission conjugate of the, of the dual space. And C star is, is actually a matrix that maps you from the emission conjugate of the dual space to S star. So to summarize, parity maps you from S to S and um, time reversal maps you from S to S star. So, um, and that, of course, this is the famous um, anti-unitary behavior of, of time reversal. The complex conjugates, the, uh, the, the representation of the Lorentz group on the spinner. So I want to ask the question, what's the group generated by P hat and T hat? They're discrete elements, so they ought to form a discrete group. Well, as I've, as I've argued, P, P maps S to S and T maps S to S star. So P squared is easy. Um, it's going to map S to S, <coughs> and uh, gamma naught squared is one, so we just get um, the square of the phase. And uh, very often it's argued that that would be that's minus one on spinners, um, but I, I'm going to give a, um, a derivation of that. Um, you can't actually follow a t hat with a t hat, because t maps S to S star. What you have to do is complex conjugate t, and say that t and calculate t star t. And that's easy enough to do. It uh, works out to be minus one. But in terms of group structure, uh, because T maps you from S to S star, it's not really forming a group. 
um, it's taking you out in space. T hat squared actually makes no sense. Um, you can only calculate T star T. And uh, if we try and calculate the product of T with P, obviously we can, we can follow a P with a T. I'll call that I for inversion. It uh, inverts space-time points in the, sp in the space-time origin. But I will take it from S to S star. But you can't follow a T with a P. You'd have to follow a T with a P star. So this makes um, right. determining a group structure um, a little uh, a little problematic, but it's it's, it's not insurmountable. Brian, um, yeah, question. Question. So uh, I should is uh, S is only the set of spinors, or are there other things that I could think of as? Uh... At the moment, S well in, in second quantization, S is the space of one particle operators, um, including creation and annihilation operators. Um, the, this Lorentz transformation properties is, is just it's a four component Dirac spinner. Can I ask you also a question? Mm -hmm. uh, TH is simply an anti-linear operator, anti-unitary operator on a Hilbert space. Okay? Yes. So it is well defined. I mean, you said TH squared is not defined. It's well defined yes. as an anti-linear operator. Yes. So yes. what is the harm in working with TH squared? Uh, well, as, lo as long as you interpret as, as, as being T star T, there's no harm at all. T hat, in the beginner analysis, what is considered this t hat or rather cpt hat what you call i i hat squared yes okay, for example in the proof of the so-called bisonian the fact that the in the rindler wedge the vacuum state becomes thermal okay the proof of yes. that due to Mitman uses cpt yes. square of the cpt okay? mm -hmm. being minus one okay? mm -hmm. so or plus one or minus one depending on the spin okay so i don't Quite understand your remark that T hat squared cannot be defined. Well, since T hat maps you from S to S star, then but strictly speaking, T hat does not act on S star, it acts on S. Well, it's, a, it's a Hilbert, complex Hilbert space. So yes. it is. Uh, yes, but I, I want to preserve, I, I want to preserve the Lorentz transformation properties. So I'm, I'm starting off with the space of spinners that transform um, under um, this four-dimensional representation D, they don't transform under D star. That's a different representation. The next transparency, the next slide will, will clear up the problem, Bal. I mean, you're right, of course, you can define T hat squared. So let me show you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to extend the space of spinners to the direct sum of S with S star. Now, and as Bal has just commented, uh, in, the, in the full complex Hilbert space, S plus S star is the full complex Hilbert space. So um, in a way, this isn't an extension, it's like a grading. I'm going to, agree, I'm going to grade the, the one particle states according to whether they transform under D or D star, the Lorentz group or the complex conjugate of the Lorentz group. And then I can implement P and T by just putting them into an eight component spinner, where the, the bottom four components are just the complex conjugate of the top four components. Then we can implement P like this, the, the bottom, uh, so this is a four by four block matrix and the bottom right matrix is just a complex conjugate of the top left matrix, but T is off diagonal. But these are now um, eight by eight matrices that map uh, the, the graded spinner space into itself. So now we can calculate uh, P squared and T squared. It's just simple matrix multiplication. We don't need to complex conjugate anything. We don't worry about anti-unitary or unitary. Uh, we just have two eight by eight matrices, and I want to work out what group these two matrices um, generate. So that's easy enough, it's just matrix multiplication. T squared indeed is minus one. Uh, P does not commute with T. P is actually T times P to the minus one. Um, though if P squared is one, T commutes with P. But if P squared is not one, they do not commute. Any even power of P, uh, just involves these two phases down the, the diagonal. Any odd power of P has a gamma naught in it. So I, I'm sorry, yeah. I have to interrupt you. Uh, in the original Wigner analysis, what he had was PT squared or some phase we see called epsilon i. Epsilon i is a phase which can be plus or minus one in an irreducible representation of the Poincare, connected Poincare group. This was called epsilon t. 
and uh, uh, it was remarked that there are the uh, when you look at the projected representations the actual group from which it comes there are four of them depending on the two choices plus minus mm -hmm. for either this or this but you are getting a unique choice i'm getting a unique how choice come? for pt squared how, yes. how yeah. come because t is off diagonal and one component has an e to the minus phi t the other has a component of e to the plus i phi t um, so the the so when you calculate the t squared the, the those two um, those two phases these two phases cancel when you calculate pt you'll have an e to the i um, phi p but then when you when you apply p a second time it's this phase that appears so all of the phases disappear in the, in this product if you multiply these two matrices together and square it, all the phases disappear. There is no ambiguity. It has to be minus one. Okay. Okay. So the next point I want to make, again, this comes back to Bal's question about the phase. If phi of P is an arbitrary phase that's irrational, then this group will never close. Because it doesn't. Because every time you you take another power of p here, you'll get a different element. If phi is rational, sorry, an irrational multiple of pi. I mean, if phi is a rational multiple of pi, then there'll be some power of p that comes gets you back to the identity. So let's assume that there exists some smallest positive integer n, for which an even power of p is equal to one. Then these two matrices p and t are generating a finite group. And we can mark out what it is in simple cases. If n is equal to 1, then uh, p squared is 1, and p and t commute. So if n is equal to 1, you just get z4 cross z2. t to the fourth is always minus 1, and p squared is 1. You just get the direct product of z4 uh, with z2. If n is equal to 2, you actually get um, a group which is, which is a quaternion group. Um, now this is, I, I, uh, I actually, I, I found this in um, this Russian paper from 1960. This is, this is Sharokov, not Sharkov, a different, different guy. Um, Sharkov made, made, found eight different groups that he could get um, under different assumptions to the ones I'm making here, but he found eight discrete groups and this was one of them. If n is equal to three, so that p to the sixth is one, um, I'll decompose P into uh, a gamma matrix and uh, a matrix involving two, two phases down a diagonal. And then um, P cubed will involve a gamma the, the, the gamma naught, but P tilde cubed is minus one. And then we get a group that looks like this. Um, I can represent the group by two generators, P tilde and T. Um, and they satisfy these relations. And uh, these relations are sufficient to determine the, the, the group. It's a group of order 12, which, which is called a dicyclic group. And when we include gamma naught, it squares to one and commutes with P and P tilde. So the full group is a, a group of order um, 24, which is a dicyclic group cross, cross Z2. And um, dicyclic groups are, they're, they're generalizations. I'm, I'm, Assuming not everyone has heard of dicyclic groups, the generalizations of dihedral groups that we know from, from crystallography. Um, the dihedral group is obtained by, you just take the cyclic group, Zn, and combine it with reflection symmetry. So, um, for example, D6 here, which I believe is a symmetry of the silica crystal, um, looks like this. If you replace reflection, where R squared equals one, with um, time reversal, where t to the fourth equals one, then the dicyclic group becomes, sorry, the, the dihedral group becomes this, -cycle, this dicyclic group. Now, if we go on and um, look at other n, in general, um, the, this, this pattern repeats. For any even n, the group you get looks like this. Um, generated by P and T. Uh, P to the N is T squared, and uh, P and T satisfy this, uh, this relation here. This is a, a discrete group of order 4N, 
and uh, DIG2 is a, is a quaternion group. For odd n, again, uh, we can decompose parity into phase times gamma naught. And um, omitting gamma naught, we get um, the dicyclic group of order n. Including gamma naught, we get um, a trivial Z2, two copies of the dicyclic group of order n. <clears throat> and here I've just written that um, by introducing p tilde and gamma naught, I'm not introducing um, new elements to the group. We can actually construct gamma naught from the, from P and T, and we can construct P tilde from P and T. So uh, this group is generated by P and T alone, but um, its representation here or its presentation is um, most easily represented in terms of P tilde and T. So um, depending on the value of this integer n, we get an infinite family of possible groups. Now let's include charge conjugation. At one level, this makes it more complicated. At another level, it simplifies it. The charge conjugation matrix, or the charge conjugation operator, excuse me, um, <clears throat> is we take the transpose of the emission conjugate and multiply by the charge conjugation matrix. So um, unfolding all of the, the, the gamma bar there, this is C times the complex conjugate of beta times psi star where um, the product C beta star actually maps S star to S. So charge conjugation um, in terms of matrix multiplication here is taken from S star into S. And conversely, the complex conjugate involves C star beta and C star beta takes you from S to S star. <coughs> and this, um, this matrix C star beta, which crops up um, in these transformations, um, satisfies this relation here, that the, the, comp the C star beta multiplied by its complex conjugate is, is the identity. So we can now, we can uh, go to extended spinner space and define an eight by eight matrix acting on the extended spinner space where um, again, it's off diagonal and um, the top right element here is this transformation here and the bottom left one is just a complex conjugate of that. So now, um, What's the group generated by P, P, T, and C? Well, C squared is one, as, um, as it has to be. Uh, C, and P don't com C and P don't commute um, if, the, if the phase here is non-trivial. And um, C and T don't commute either. The phases phi T and phi C crop up here. So again, I'll assume that um, phi t plus phi c is, is a rational multiple of pi. So there's the smallest integer p for which um, this power is one. And remember there's a small, smallest integer n for which this power is one. So we get a doubly infinite series of possible groups labeled by the two integers n and p. You can work out the properties. Uh, the powers of ct um, eventually will be one, but the, the, the order you have to take uh, depends on, on um, P mod eight. Uh, and again, we get uh, an infinite series with a different presentation depending on whether N is even or odd. If N is even, it looks like this, C squared is one. Um, and this integer M here is uh, obtained from these four equations here, whichever one, um, well, these three equations here, if N is even, it's one of these three. Um, and if n is odd, again, we have to spray, uh, break p up into p tilde and gamma naught, and we get a presentation that looks like this. Um, I'm not aware of any name for these groups in the mathematical literature, um, but in fact, with one, with, with one further assumption, we can, we can simplify the whole thing. And the assumption I'm going to, if, if we make a, the assumption that, um, the parity inverse of a Majorana spinner is also a Majorana spinner. And the, the, parity, the, sorry, the parity transform of a Majorana spinner is also a Majorana spinner. And I'll assume that the parity transform of a time reversed, sorry, the, the, the time reverse of a Majorana spinner is also a Majorana spinner. So let's take the parity, if, if we have a Majorana spinner, so C Psi equals Psi, then, um, 
PC psi must be P psi. And I'm going to assume that P psi is also Majorana. So P psi must be C P psi. And there's a similar argument for time reversal. So um, we immediately conclude that actually C must compute with P and C must compute with T. But I, I still maintain that if, if you don't um, introduce charge conjugation, then um, these dicyclic groups you get from P and T, C is not an element of the Lorentz group. If you're only looking at the Lorentz group, all you have is P and T, and then the, there's, um, a, you get this full this, um, series, for, for, for faithful representations, you get this full series of dicyclic groups. But when you introduce um, charge conjugation, if you just assume, if you assume that, um, parity and time reversal don't um, change the nature of a Majorana spinner, it remains Majorana, then we, we uh, get that C has to commute with P and C has to commute with T. And that then constrains these integers because um, this is what CP looks like, this is what CT looks like. So if I want C to commute with P, uh, e to the 2i two, two phi P has to be minus 1. So phi has got to be, as Bao was saying earlier, this is the usual assumption uh, on spinners that phi has to be um, plus or minus pi over two. And if I want t to commute with c, then this has to be one. So phi t plus phi c has to be um, an integral multiple of pi. So demanding that charge conjugation, um, well, parity and time reversal preserve the uh, Majorana property of four, four dimensional Dirac spinners, uh, these two integers n and p are completely constrained, and the only group we're left with is a quaternion group. Everything else is thrown out. So um, that's the the main point I want to make about the the group structure of these discrete symmetries. That we actually get the, the quaternion group, and I maintain that that's the only that's actually if you want faithful representations, that's the only one you can use when you're acting on Dirac spinners. Um, well, that's, and it's a nice mathematical result, but is there any physics in this? Um, oh, well, let, first of all, let me um, <clears throat> just in, um, apply this to CPT. So the CPT theorem says that, uh, uh, well, the combination CPT in this formulation, all we're doing is multiplying eight by eight matrices. This is theta. And, um, this has to be plus or minus i in front of gamma phi. There's a, an ambiguity in sign here. I mean, I could have used um, plus i or minus i for the, the phase in parity. Um, so you, there could be a plus or minus in here. But apart from that ambiguity in, in um, the sign of theta, this is the only possibility you have. There has to be i gamma phi in there. There's no arbitrary phase in here. Um, so acting on Dirac spinners, theta just completely inverts the space-time point and the space-time origin and multiplies by a gamma matrix for every coordinate, gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. And this is the combination of CPT and necessarily theta squared is minus one. And this is the, um, one of the key ingredients in the proof of the CPT theorem. You then go on to apply this to Fermi bilinears and prove that all possible physical bilinears you can make are invariant under under CPT. Um, is there any, okay, so that's all I want to say about um, the CPT act, acting on spinners. Um, this is all, there's nothing, the, the only um, ingredient here is I'm, I'm saying that the, the group generated by CP and T has to be the quaternion group. Um, but on fermion bilinears, uh, you, you don't see the quaternion nature of these things. So it's, it's hard to see any physical consequences of this. Um, but one place where uh, CP and T are, 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 um, are a very fruitful place for studying CPT, of course, is, is in uh, pseudoscale and mesons, uh, the k ons and the, and the B meson systems. So if you look at bilinears, in particular uh, quark bilinears, um, psi bar gamma phi psi prime, where psi and psi prime are different. So for example, um, if psi was a, um, creates an S bar and uh, psi bar creates a D, then we get a, a neutral k on. If psi creates a, a, an anti B meson and psi bar creates a D, we get, we get a B naught. 
So in terms of the extended spin of, spa spin of space, we're looking for um, a Hermitian Lorentz invariant bilinear on S tilde. And there's actually two possibilities. We could take beta, and here we could take plus or minus beta, uh, the complex conjugate of beta. These are both Lorentz invariant combinations. If we um, spill this out into four component spinners, the upper one is psi bar psi primed minus psi bar prime psi, the minus sign because we have to anti-commute psi primed through psi in order to get this combination. And the lower sign uh, gives us a plus. So in particular, if psi was equal to psi primed, then um, the upper sign here would give us nothing. So the upper sign here looks as though it's not going to be um, particularly relevant to constructing Lagrangians. Um, but it could, it's still relevant for pseudoscalar mesons because um, psi prime is not equal to psi for pseudoscalar mesons. And in particular, um, if we construct an 8 by 8 gamma 5, then we, uh, if you look at the, the B mesons, for example, um, for depending on whether we take plus or minus in the bilinear here, uh, we get linear combinations of neutral B mesons, which are precisely the CP eigenstates. Uh, the plus sign here gives you B0 minus B0 bar. So the subscripts here are the CP. So B0 minus B0 bar is CP minus, and B0 plus B0 bar is CP plus. So uh, the, the two possible Lorentz invariant metrics on the extended spin of space give us uh, the CP eigenstates in a neutral, neutral pseudoscalar meson system. And the neutral B mesons are. are um, that's where T violation was first discovered um, definitively. Well, not first discovered, definitively discovered um, in, in 2011. And it was, it's a beautiful experiment. Um, so let me, I'd like to um, spend a bit of time, oh, I'm not an experimentalist. Um, it's, it's, it's such a lovely experiment that it, and, and it's, it is relevant to, the, to what I'm saying here. So um, the idea was that you, in a, um, electron positron collider, um, if you produce um, an upsilon, which is a BB bar, a neutral BB bar meson, then the upsilon um, will decay to um, B mesons. So the, the, the upsilon is, is um, uh, the, the, the B quantum number for the upsilon is zero because it's a BB bar, I can say. But the B bar can go off and make a, um, a neutral B meson here with a, with a down quark, so this would be a B bar um, down. And the B can go off and, and make a, an anti B naught, so this will be a, um, a, a, D, a, a B bar with a, a down, an anti down quark. Um, and then as different things can happen, uh, the B naught could decay to a lepton, the semi leptonic decay to some positive lepton and hadronic stuff. And uh, B0 bar, which is a flavor eigenstate, can oscillate um, and to either a B plus or a B minus. If it oscillated to B plus and the B plus decays, then this is a CP eigenstate and it must, a CB plus eigenstate, and it must decay. And, and it decays to a CP plus eigenstate, which is a combination of a gypsy and a K long. K long is CP minus, but the gypsy is also CP minus. This is a CP plus state. Um, alternatively, Um, we could get a uh, the we could get a, a combination of a B plus and B minus here, and the B minus will decay um, not to a, a gypsy KL but to a gypsy KS. So this is a CP minus I can see, and the B plus oscillates here to B naught bar, which then decays to the um, negative lepton here, and the um, antiparticles are drawn to. So here we have, we're oscillating from B plus to B naught bar, and here we're oscillating from B naught bar to B plus. And you can tell which it is from the, um, the decay, uh, the, 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 the final um, decay states. Uh, if, if you see a, a positive lepton and a K long, you know it's B naught bar to B plus. If you see a negative lepton and a K short, you know it's B plus to B naught bar. There's other stuff that can happen. Um, there's actually eight possible things that can happen. Um, 
you could go to the B naught could go to an L plus X, and then the B naught bar could oscillate to a B minus or a B plus. Or the, the, the anti B could go to um, an L minus X, and the B naught can oscillate to a B minus or a B plus. Um, so you might see L plus X coming out here on uh, these two things. Or you might see an L minus X on these two things. But whatever happens, um, you can tell from the decay um, products here what oscillation it was. So if there's any time difference between these two processes, I mean, this, this one here is just the, the time reverse of this one. If there's any time difference between these two processes, then that's a violation of time reversal symmetry. And indeed, that is exactly what's, um, what's, what's observed. There is a time difference. And everything in the, all these decays are uh, CP preserving. So there's no CP violation here. So this time uh, asymmetry has to be, um, this has to be T violation, not CP violation. There was an earlier experiment using kaons, which tried to do something similar, but then the, 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 um, the decays were CP violating and uh, it was, there was a bit of controversy over to whether or not they were really seeing T violation or CP violation. But this experiment is completely clean. All of these decays are CP conserving. The only possibility for a, an, an asymmetry between these two processes is, um, is T violation. And one of the really nice things about this experiment is that the B naught and the B naught bar are um, they're entangled. Um, once the B naught decays to an L plus here, you immediately know this is a B a B naught bar, but you don't measure it. Um, it's crucially important that these things are entangled. If you try to measure either, if you, if you try to measure uh, both of these as, as flavor states, you would just destroy the destroy the experiment. It's crucial relies on quantum entanglement. Um, so it's, it's crucial that the B naught and the B naught, B naught bar are, are entangled. Um, oops, that should be a superscript, sorry. Okay, so that's uh, this um, Babar experiment, um, which is a, a clear signal of, um, of T violation. Okay, well, let me go to a discussion of what I've tried to say here. I've tried to act, I've tried to argue that um, if you, for a faithful representation of parity and time reversal in the Lorentz group, if you include charge conjugation, uh, there, there is a, a non-trivial finite group generated by I, T and P, and, it, and it's the quaternion group. So obviously, um, you want to know are there any physical consequences of this? It's hard to think of any. Um, on fermion bilinears, uh, you always have a, a T atom and a psi and a T bar, uh, sorry, a T atom and a psi and a T atom and a psi bar. All of these phases cancel. Um, on fermion bilinears, you cannot tell TP apart from PT. On fermion bilinears, it's always just Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2. So I, haven't, I don't think there are any physical consequences of this, um, of this relation here. However, I would argue that um, p squared is minus one could possibly be observed um, on electrons uh, as destructive interference in a two-slit experiment. For example, if you suppose we do, we do a two-slit experiment and one path goes, um, one path, if we reflect the electron off a mirror and then ro rotate it through two pi, or um, rotate it through pi, excuse me, Reflecting off a mirror and then rotating through pi is a parity transformation. So if, if one electron is reflected off a mirror, then rotated through pi, and then you do it twice, then you've acted on that electron with p squared. And if the other electron is not um, so affected, then when you combine the paths, there'll be a shift in the interference pattern. In particular, if the paths are of equal length, then um, the maximum and minima will be completely interchanged in the interference pattern. So um, I would argue that this phase of pi over two on electrons is physical um, and it ought to be possible to observe it. Now, as far as I know, this experiment has not been done, but I don't see anything in principle saying you couldn't do it. You could always, um, you can rotate an electron by passing it through the magnetic field um, and the, the electrons wouldn't have to be particularly high energy. Uh, I, don't see any reason why an experiment like this could not be done. Um, it's hard to see how T squared might be implemented in two-slit experiment. 
or PP equals minus PT. In fact, um, because of the CPT theorem, if, if, if you have a CP eigenstate, then um, you expect that also to be a T eigenstate. But on fermions, um, T eigenstates don't make a lot of sense on fermions. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, is there any point I can go back to? Yeah. Um, this is just an eight by eight matrix. Um, its fourth power is minus one. T squared is minus one. So the eigenvalues are plus on this matrix is eigenvalues are plus or minus i. But the eigen spinners are not in this space. The, this space here, but this space here, the lower spinner is the complex conjugate of the upper spinner. You can construct eigenvectors of this, this eight by eight matrix, but it won't, the lower eigen, the lower uh, component will not be the complex conjugate of the upper component. So the, the eigenvectors of this matrix, uh, this, this matrix here don't make any physical sense. Um, but won't they be Majorana? Um, isn't it equivalent to demanding that? I don't think so because the eigenvalues of t are plus or minus i, um, and my is a real spinner, so the, the, the analog of real spinners. I don't think um, my would help you there because it's fundamentally complex. I don't think the, eigen, the eigenspinners of t, um, I've not been able to think of a physical. Um, interpretation of the eigenspinners of T. Maybe there is one, um, but I've not been able to think of one. So it's hard to see how T squared um, could be implemented, or if you could ever observe this anti-commutativity of, of T and P in a, in a physical experiment. But this I think is doable. I, I would, I, it ought to be possible to check um, with the, the phase of P on, on electrons. Okay, that's um. There's any, there's what more? Oh, there's one more thing I could say. I've got a little bit of time left, so let me um, oops, go to and um, the anti 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 unitary nature of, of T. Um, you can see that in this eight by eight form formalism um, uh, quite easily. The definition of unitary and anti unitary transformations are here: a unitary transformation. Um, on a Hilbert space uh, it takes, uh, so you, have a, you, you form the bilinear and then u psi bar, u psi prime is just equal to psi bar, psi prime. For an antilinear transformation, um, it's the complex conjugate here. In fact, in, in a fox space, uh, there's a dagger here rather than a star. This has to be a fox space dagger as well, the complex conjugation of C numbers. Um, and that dagger interchanges the order of the two spinners. Um, so for our three or our three eight by eight matrices in, in this eight by eight formulation, um, I haven't really mentioned the anti unitary nature of T, and it comes in here because uh, with our eight by eight, eight by eight matrices, p psi bar p psi prime is equal to psi bar psi prime, so p is unitary, c is unitary, but um, The T matrix, A, B, T matrix actually gives you minus psi bar psi. So that doesn't look unitary or anti unitary. But um, what you have to remember is that time reversal reverses the order of fermions. And that, for me, that's really, uh, it's not the anti, the, it's not the anti, anti unitary aspect of T that's important. For me, the important thing about um, time reversal is it reverses the order of fermions. So if I interchange psi prime and psi here, uh, the matrices all work out fine but um, you're interchanging two spinners, you get a minus sign, you get an extra minus sign. So the operation of T hat in this eight dimensional um, formalism is actually minus what you get from just the matrix multiplication. And this is analogous to the anti unitary nature of, of T hat in the usual four component spinner formalism where um, T hat complex conjugates things so it would send beta to beta star and that changes signs. So, um, in the eight by eight formulation, the operator T hat has to include the interchange of two spinners and it's anti-unitary. That T hat should interchange two spinners um, is very natural, I think. Well, first of all, it was emphasized by Bell in his paper on, on, on CPT. He actually argues that um, 
changing the sign of, 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 of beta um, is equivalent to interchanging the order of spinners. And I think it's very natural that um, time universal should interchange the order of spinners. For example, um, I've been talking really about free fields here, but um, in an interesting inter interacting quantum field theory, um, these things are composite operators. And to make sense of them, uh, one thing you could do is split the points and then uh, take the limit of the two points approaching each other. But when you do that, if you split the points, then you've chosen a time ordering. And time reversal must interchange the two points. So it's quite natural, I think, that time reversal should interchange um, the order of the spinners. For me, that's more important than complex conjugating things. It's the interchanging the spinners, I think, that's, that's really the most important part of it. Um, so with, with uh, this construction of T hat, the, the CPT theorem, um, you actually need to uh, define a theta hat, which also interchanges spinners, interchanges spinners. And um, so T hat is minus um, the product you get with just matrices, and theta hat is minus the product you get with just matrices. And then you prove all these usual bilinear identities that you'll find on any in, in any uh, textbook on, on the relativistic quantum field theory, proving the, um, the CPT theorem. Um, but what I like about this eight by eight formulation is that you, you never you never need to complex conjugate anything. You don't you don't need to worry about unitary or anti-unitary operations. All you have to do is remember that uh, time reversal changes the order of spinners, and then everything else drops out. Okay, so I think. Um, that's probably uh, all I want to say. My time is almost up. Um, just one, one final uh, slide I have, um, which is related to, and I'm sure as everyone knows, has heard the story of um, when Hamilton um, had his insight for, of the quaternion algebra, when he was trying to understand the algebra of rotations in three-dimensional space. <clears throat> and he'd been trying to generalize complex numbers to three dimensions. Uh, and he had this flash of insight when he was walking from Dunsink Observatory in Dublin to the Royal Irish Academy in Dawson Street. Um, and, and those were the days when um, he was going to a meeting of the Royal Irish Academy. He was president of the Royal Irish Academy and he was going to a meeting. And in going to his meeting at the Royal Irish Academy, he, he could afford to take the time to walk from Dunsink to Dawson Street, which is nearly a two hour walk. Um, they, 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 they must have been... Uh, much more relaxed times than nowadays. I don't think anyone uh, would take two hours to walk to a meeting these days. Um, but the famous story is that he, he had this flash of insight as he was passing um, a bridge over a canal, Broom Bridge over the Royal Canal, and he scratched the formula for quaternions on, on the bridge. Uh, now, in normal times before COVID, uh, in, I commute out to Maynooth on the train, and my nearest train station is Broom Bridge. So almost every day, there's a plaque at Broombridge commemorating um, Hamilton's uh, Eureka moment. So I, I go past this plaque almost every day. So I must admit, I couldn't help uh, indulging in a little bit of graffiti of my own. This is a plaque at Broombridge with Hamilton's famous formula here. And uh, I, I couldn't help um, taking a little bit of chalk and doing my, my own graffiti here. But I assure you, this is just chalk. Uh, it, it, it would wash off in a few days, of, a couple of days of rain. So no permanent vandalism, I hope. OK, so that's um, all I wanted to say. I don't think there's anything really new in, in what I've presented here, but I've um, presented, presented it in a, in, in a different way that I, I hope um, is uh, reasonably clear and, and, and it avoids a lot of the mysticism of, of Vanke unity transformations. Um, so uh, I'll stop with that and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Brian. And the floor yeah. is open to questions. Paul, are you happy? I can ask a question. Yes. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, regarding parity, there is an old result that the relative parity of a proton and an antiproton is minus one. Yes. So, 
there are ex there were experiments there are probably of the annihilation and proton anti proton annihilation at rest the two pions and three pions okay and the the relative parity will also tell that they are annihilating in the s state or p state the final products are different okay? yes there are there were results i don't know just been followed okay i wonder whether what happens here in your calculation okay? oh it will be the same valid it's um I mean, it, it, it will have, it will end up, the, the relative parity of a Fermi and anti-Fermi on um, bound state is, is minus one in this formulation as well. Um, because I, all I'm doing is formulating what's already known. It's not, um, it's just a different way of doing the same thing. Uh, so the relative parity of a Fermi and anti-Fermi bound state has to be, will be negative. Um, and I don't know the proton experiments you're describing, but, uh, and I do know that this has been checked in electron positron annihilation where a bound state of an electron and a positron can annihilate. Um, and depending whether the spins are, are opposite or parallel, you have different parity, you know, the ortho and para positronium, and the number of photons it goes to tells you what the parity of the bound state is. And, and um, yeah, the Fermi and anti-Fermi bound state has, has negative parity. Okay. Uh, what, uh, just follow it up. Well, uh, what I was told was that the annihilation at rest, if you consider things like positron-electron annihilation, there is a question of orbital angular momentum. So one has to control that also yes. to know what are the final products. Okay? Yes. For annihilation at rest, when people are doing that experiment that PP for annihilation at rest, that issue is much better under control because it's at rest. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's say every month. But I want to ask the normally the the groups you are getting seems to be different from what Bugner tabulates in this you, that Gursey volume, and also in that uh, review by with uh, Van Dam and uh, Hauptafel, I think. Hauptafel and Van. So one question I would ask is: Normally, these ambiguities, for example, in the uh, signs you are writing, were resolved in course of time by demanding causality. That is, the transform of the field should be relatively causal to the original field. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then one can see quite easily. In fact, it is in Weinberg's book, it resolves the phase issues uniquely. So fermions it is minus one, uh, the square of uh, a square of C, PT and T are minus one, and for bosons it is plus one. Okay? What happens here in your case? Um, the square of CPT, you're asking for the square of CPT. Uh, what they call PT is what you call CPT. Okay. So, because... Uh, sorry, I don't understand. I, I, my definition of P and T is the same as in Weinberg. Uh, this, th this equation here, if you put beta equal to gamma naught and uh, choose a representation in which C is real, this equation here is what's in Weinberg. Exactly the same equation. Weinberg has um, T hat is a phase times C times gamma uh, gamma five times psi at minus T. It's the what same. Was, what causality results was the square of these operators, not this. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what is given in Weinberg's book is for a free field. If you take a field and this apply uh, a th on it, is that field relatively local to the original field? Oh, you mean that, but your t and th, uh, th is an operator, is a double dot, it's not a double dot operator, it's a double dot operator, right? Sorry, what do you mean by a double dot operator? You took psi and psi star in the column. It is a double operator, his T hat, yeah. It's on an eight dimensional space, is what you mean, oh, isn't it? Mean, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm defining it on this, um, yeah. on this eight dimensional space, yeah. Uh, this one, this one. This mm -hmm. one it's not clear to me that this field, as it stands, and if I take X, another point which is space like related to X, and consider the field, they are literally local. Because that involves anti commutators of psi with psi star. And I don't know what that is. So you want to take another field at a different point? 
Sai normally is causal, causal anti, has a causal anti commutativity. Oh, yeah, okay, so you're talking about the relations with of the field itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're Sai star, I don't know what that yeah. is. Yeah. Um, well, it'll be exactly the same as, as in Weinberg's book. I mean, I, I'm, as I say, this is just a grading of Fox space. Uh, the, the single the single particle fox space operators but the operator you're defining seem to be different because the algebra, the algebra seems to be different from what Wigner gets um sure. from what Wigner gets i'm not sure i haven't looked at Wigner's original paper in detail but it's the same as weinberg i mean weinberg um also uses Majorana fermions to determine the um, the phase of p and um, he gets this phase to be um plus or minus i, again, using a Majorana fermion argument. Um, but he, he doesn't, I, I, I don't think any, I mean, he, he calculates the product CPT, but he doesn't calculate the algebra of, of these elements. But it should be the same. I mean, I, I, I think this is, just a, this is just a mathematical trick to make it easier. Um, it's not doing anything different to the standard, standard approach. But you are getting many more extensions than Wigner did. So, um, well, what I'm saying is that if, 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 if the, the only assumption that you make is this, for a faithful representation, then you get an infinite series. You may wish to argue that on fermions, uh, p squared should be minus one. Um, and as I've said, you, you can do that, but it does require um, a further assumption. With, with the smallest possible set of assumptions, um, th this, is, this is what you get. Is that suggesting that there should be an, that there could potentially be a particle other than the electron who's, for which as a P... Thing, I, I, I don't think squared. So. The, when you include C, I mean, the, the logic is I, I was trying to start off just with P and T, which are elements of the Lorentz group, and not using C. Yes, but P is a, an element of the Lorentz group. So you, if you have something that's transforming differently, a different power of it is minus one, or a different power of it, you have to raise um, it to a different power to get one, it's presumably physically a different representation. Yes, um, it would be a different physical representation. Um, for my Rana fermions, the, the, the P squared has to be minus one. Um, and I, I think you can conclude that it has to be the same for the Dirac fermions, because you can always write out the Dirac fermion as a linear combination for some, my Rana fermions. Yeah. So I think the fact that the P squared is minus one for my Rana when you include charge conjugation. Um, tells you that it has to be minus one for um, for all fermions, all Dirac fermions. Yeah. There may be a way out of that, but I um, I, I doubt it. Um, I wonder to what extent you really can replace a p-transformation by a reflection from the mirror. Well, for, for the momentum, of course, it works. But uh, normally, a reflection from the mirror wouldn't change the velocity. Uh, so, sorry, could you say that last sentence again, Werner? I, 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 so, reflection from a mirror would not change the velocity. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Parity, um, no, hang on. Parity does not change velocity. Velocity um, is a pseudo vector, but parity. Oh, helicity, sorry, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, reflection from mirror followed by rotation through pi about a normal to the mirror is exactly the same as parity. And it's, it's the parity transformation that, I, that I'm um, talking about here. I mean, uh, uh, when you uh, suggested an experiment, then uh, presumably you were talking about a real mirror. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, 
Well, it's like, uh, I mean, I'm not sure experimentally how you would construct a mirror that would exactly reflect an, an electron. But I mean, it's just to say, I mean, it's very similar to um, reflecting a beam of light off of, of an ordinary silver mirror, the phase changes. I mean, can you not do it with some sort of, uh, with some electric field? Oh, I'm sure, yeah, and I, I'm sure there are ways of doing it, but I'm not an experimentalist. So I um, can you do it with neutrons? Say, say that again, Georgia. I was thinking of neutrons, you know, Zang uh, seems to be able to do anything with this. Neutrons. Yeah, experimentalists can do these things quite, quite easily, I'm sure. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to make any too strong statements of it. I would be done because I'm not an experimentalist. Oh, you, you want to do it with a, Georgia wants to do it with a neutron and reflect a neutron somehow. Um, yes, yeah, and, and that, I mean, you could rotate neutrons in a magnetic field as well, so, um, Yep, you could try it with neutrons. Hmm. Now, I'm not volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> Can you mention on the side, this is not exact, since uh, Brian is raising fundamental issues, like uh, there is a result, which is normally called the Landau Yang selection rule. Okay? And it uses only Poincare invariance under the connected Poincare group. Okay? And it says, well, in the original Landau Yang research, is that Z naught cannot decay to two photons. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's the absolute selection rule. And if it is violated, then that I would say uh, it will create big trouble for all of quantum field theory because the connective Poincare group will not be valid exactly. Okay? So sorry, sorry, what is the, the statement, Bal? Can you say yes, it sir. can? Is it not going to two gamma? Is forbidden. Is forbidden by Poincare invariance. Okay? Huh. So uh, we uh, I try to understand that. So that result has not been experimentally in. Principle, they can do the experiment in LHC, but uh, they have not looked at it from what I when I talk to the people because mm -hmm. of the fact that there is a huge background. Okay? However, quite remarkably, people doing quantum optics, I checked it, the reverse process where they take two coherent photons in the uh, nonlinear optics, two coherent photons, and impinge it on an atom okay? and see mm -hmm. if there is a Delta J equal to one transition. Okay. So it's a reverse process. And again, they have put very severe limits on in those experiments, not actually say very safe. They put limits on this process. Okay. The limits are as not as good as what we get from LFC and so forth. Okay. This result actually generalizes. One can prove quite uh, by analyzing tensor products of Poincare representations and uh, decomposing it into irreducibles. We analyze this. We try to see what this result meant. And it was purely a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient result. And it says that a, a particle, massive particle of odd integer spin cannot decay into two identical particles of the same helicity. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, if somebody finds such a process, for example, is that not going to two neutrinos, okay? identical neutrinos, okay? then Poincare invariance is violated. Okay? So, the kind of thing that uh, the, uh, I think Brian is saying is in this general set of results, which are uh, doesn't require a name. They're super, they're super predictions. Mm -hmm. they're, I, I don't think I can say anything as, as strong as that, Bal. Um, huh? I don't think I can say anything as strong as that. Uh, I mean, you, the, the result you're referring to, you say is connected uh, Poincaré group. So and um, P and T are in the disconnected Lorentz group. Um, that that's true, but you see. But also, sorry. If CPT, CPT is violated, okay. so CPT squared is minus one. Okay. Yes. Uh, what you call it? Yes. Squared. That is what. Uh, oh. of, and it is plus one on bosons. Okay. It's plus one on fermion bilinears. It's minus one on fermions. Yeah. Uh, I squared is minus one on uh, fermions. Minus one to the two J. Okay. That's general rule. Okay. 
if it is violated then this uh, because of this uh, result that comes from for example algebraic quantum field theory one violates causality okay yeah? so that's one result i mean cp d squared can you check is plus or minus one presumably experimental the kind of things you are telling with interference may be able to check it but it violates uh, well I, perhaps but i mean the the only when I, I couldn't actually think of an experimental way of, of if you're going to you want to check that theta squared is minus one you have to be able to check that um to, to, to check t squared um and I, I couldn't think of an experimental way of doing that p squared i can see um i couldn't see any experimental consequences of t squared is minus one uh, but maybe maybe experimentalists can be very clever I, I, okay i don't know i mean on and off i have thought about how to do the experiment i don't know okay it would need to be on fermions on on bilinear on fermion bilinears um this is trivial you just get z2 cross z2 cross z2 okay i think i think you need to find some way of doing um t and c on on fermions alone and um yeah i maybe you could do it with neutrinos but that would be obviously a long way down the line okay Nice seminar. Okay. Thanks for it. Brings back Thanks issues. very much. Yeah. Go ahead, Bal. No, it brings back issues which were yeah. uh, which are you know which are at the background of quantum field theory. Uh, I think uh, Wigner calls them as super super selection, the super rules yeah. Yeah. for mm -hmm. constructing any theory. So. Uh, you're bringing this issue back. Berner looks like he wants to say something. No, okay, all right. Uh, is, is that Al Stern I see there? Has he gone? I don't know. Oh, he's, I think he may have disappeared. Okay. Just suddenly when I was saying hello to him. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and we can thank Brian again and stop the recording. Okay. Yeah. You can continue anyone that wants to.